Manager of Web Accessibility at Facebook. Uh, with me speaking today is Rania Sathraman. She's the engineering lead of Web Accessibility at Facebook. And we're going to spend the next half an hour or so talking a little bit about how our team came into existence, some of the things that we have done to try to scale Web Accessibility at Facebook. Um, and Rania's going to talk about some of the things that we have done to improve the product for accessibility uh, and for compatibility with assistive technology. So before talking about web accessibility, I want to talk about accessibility. So in the broadest sense of the term, um, making sure that your product works for as many people as possible, both available to them and usable, is really the, the true definition of accessibility. And this is something that our company has thought about quite a bit over its pretty short lifespan. One of the things that we realized pretty quickly into the uh, company's existence was that the largest barrier to access was the fact that it was only available in English. So if we were going to build a product that was usable across the globe, we needed to make sure that it was available in other languages. So we put together a small engineering team that came up with a way to make sure that all of our products were being translated into languages around the world. And now we support over 70 plus languages. Of course, the reason I'm here is to speak to you about web accessibility, which is a slightly narrower focus within accessibility. And it's really about the set of things that we can do to make sure that our products or our experiences are usable by people who may have low vision, people who are blind, people who may have cognitive disabilities, people who may be deaf, or pe people who may have lost motor control, people who might rely on a keyboard to interact with the web and their computer, and they might not use a mouse. And this is the set of things that my small team focuses on, it, on at Facebook. And we're responsible for making sure how to do this across the board with all of our products. So the central challenge of my team is making this possible across many different versions of our products. So we have www.facebook.com, we have m.facebook.com, we have mtouch, uh, which is a mobile version. Uh, we have Facebook for Android, Facebook for iOS, we have uh, Facebook Messenger for iOS, Facebook Messenger for Android. We have over 15 different flavors of Facebook. And we want to make sure that all these different flavors work really well in assistive technology and for accessibility. So the, the key thing that we're going to return to quite a bit in this talk is, is talking through how we try to make this possible, how we enable engineers across Facebook include accessibility in the products that they're building. So I want to first um, start by talking a little bit about where the team sits. So uh, this is a photo of me and the manager of a team called User Interface Engineering. Now User Interface Engineering is responsible for all of the core components that comprise Facebook. So a core component might be something like a link, or a menu, or a button, any of these atomic bits uh, that comprise the Facebook experience and are reused across the product. So about two years ago, I went to the, the manager of this team, and I said that in order for us to make accessibility really core to our development process, we needed to make sure that it worked really well for our core components. If we could make sure that things were compatible in assistive technology, uh, in our core components and all the product teams around the company from photos to events to profile to newsfeed, all of these groups would get accessibility for free because these core components were built with accessibility in mind. So Nan gave the nod and I would say that this was our first bet on trying to make accessibility scale within a larger engineering environment. And this has paid major dividends for us. Um, we're we're kind of lucky to be sitting within this group because this also happens to be some of our best front-end developers at Facebook. And they hold very sacred the quality of the components that they're shipping. So they're very responsive to want to, want to make sure that their products, their components work really well for accessibility. Um, the core team is really comprised of three people today. It's myself, I'm the project manager. Uh, there's Ramya, she's the engineering lead. And then we have George. Uh, George is our QA specialist. He's responsible for figuring out our process around making sure that we have quality assurance with all the products that are being built across different platforms. 
But this really belies the number of people who are working on accessibility uh, at Facebook, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means later. But there are lots of people at Facebook who are working on making the products accessible and writing accessible code. So we really focus on providing tools to them, documentation, things that will make them autonomous on accessibility. So before we talk a little bit about what that process looks like, I'm going to let Ramya show you some of the things that we've done over the past year and a half to make our products better for accessibility and better for assistive technology. This is a photo of my one-year-old when she tasted yogurt for the very first time in her life. She made this really cute scratched up face and I immediately took a picture and uploaded it to Facebook. I thought the photo spoke for itself so I did not enter a caption for the photo and I got a bunch of likes and comments and I was really happy. Until a few days later when I was auditing newsfeed with voiceover. I tapped to this photo and voiceover announced photo1.png. The entire essence of the photo was lost because I had failed to enter a caption for this photo. So I immediately went and updated my post, entered a description for the photo, but I work on Facebook accessibility. How can we expect millions of people around this world to always enter a caption for their photos? How do we solve the problem of making billions of user-generated photos on Facebook accessible to screen readers. To solve this problem, we built something called the Caption Generator. The Caption Generator looks at bits of metadata associated with the photo. Who uploaded the photo, where was the photo taken, who are the people tagged in the photo, and it generates a caption for the photo so that the screen reader can deliver a richer description for the photo. I'm going to show you a demo of how photos are read with voiceover before and after we apply the caption generator. technical limit, but we try to make it as good an experience as possible. 
I'm going to continue with the rest of the demo. One of the first few things we focused on was semantic structure. We all understand why headings are important for screen readers. What you see here is a screenshot of newsfeed with the headings of the different sections called out. Each news story has a heading of H5. On the left hand side where you see links for newsfeed, messages, photos, etc. There are headings of H4. And on the right hand side, the different subsections have a heading of H6. Closely related to headings are landmarks and we've implemented them on Facebook. Think of landmarks as logical chunks in a web page. So you have the main content in the center, probably a banner at the top, some navigation on the left hand side and related content on the right hand side. Now we mark each of these sections as a landmark so that people using screen readers can jump to a particular landmark and read the content within that landmark. Jeff talked a little bit about how we focused our accessibility efforts into our core components first. Um, this was a big win for us because our core components are reused across all the product surfaces on www.facebook.com. So if you think of graph search or groups or pages, any accessibility enhancements that we build into the core components, we get that for free on these product surfaces. What I show here is a screenshot of a profile page of a person with the semantic markup generated by these core components called out on the page. This is a picture of um, the internal camp that we organized at Facebook for Global Accessibility Awareness Day last year on May 9. Uh, there's a photo of uh, Mark Rossman who gave a compelling screen reader demo and a lot of our engineers were really interested uh, to learn more about how screen readers work and about accessibility in general. Now, besides deciding logistics for this event, Jeff and I also created a Facebook event for the day. So I went to www.facebook.com slash events and I pulled up the events calendar for me. I tapped to May 9th, which was the day of the event, and activated that link to launch a dialogue which would capture all the event details for me. Now the nice thing about this dialogue was that I did not have to use my mouse to place keyboard focus within the dialogue. This happened automatically for me. And this was really useful for me because I had suffered a painful episode of carpal tunnel syndrome a few years back and since then I have leaned towards using the keyboard and less of the mouse. So when this dialogue was launched I did not have to use my mouse and keyboard focus moved to the first focusable field in this dialogue. In this case, it's the name of the event. Now, managing keyboard focus for dialogues is really important because dialogues involve a change in context. You're initially looking at this background page which has a bunch of dates and then you activate a link and now your, your focus should be on this little dialogue and should not jump back and forth between the dialogue and the background page. For every dialogue that we launch, we associate a heading with a dialogue. In this case, you see a screenshot of the Create New Event dialogue. Create New Event is the heading that's announced when this dialogue is launched. And Focus, as I mentioned earlier, goes to the Name Input field in the dialogue. As you tap, Focus moves to the next focusable field in the dialogue until we reach the very last button in the dialogue. In this case, it's the Cancel button. Now when I tab out of this button, I do not want focus jumping back to the previous page. I want it to cycle with, within this dialog so that for a person using a screen reader, it's very clear what the context is. And that's exactly what we do with our core dialog component. We also shipped a number of keyboard shortcuts on newsfeed. These are keys like the J key and the K key to move to the next and previous story in newsfeed the O key to open an attachment uh, such as a photo or link associated with a story. Um, now th these are popular because they are used by keyboard only users, our keyboard power users and screen reader users. I'm going to show you a short demo of our keyboard shortcuts on your screen. Press the B key to 
Let's not the composer and write a new post for status update. Press the L key to like the post. Press the C key to comment on the post. Press the S key to share the post. Press the O key to open attachments like photos. Press the Q key to chat. for Facebook newsfeed. So when you're reading through your different news stories, if you press your J key, your keyboard focus will move to the next story. This is for the desktop. That, that is correct. Uh, if you use JAWS and if you press the J key, it's going to launch this little dialog that says jump to line instead of jump to next post. This is a problem we are actively brainstorming and trying to solve because we do want people using screen readers to efficiently jump to different sections on the page. For instance, the P key to focus on the composer. And if you use this as voiceover, the experience is pretty good. We have not solved the problem of how we prevent these keys from conflicting with JAWS because JAWS has keyboard shortcuts for pretty much all the keys on the keyboard. Um, there's a gentleman who has a question at the back. So on JAWS, um, currently you can disable virtual mode real quick and then use your keys there. Yeah, yeah right. we, we, we tried that. But I think we'll have a conversation after. I think if there's a way for Facebook to expose to us what your hot keys are when you're on that page, yeah, that's great. Yeah, the insert Z mode to, yeah, to switch, yeah. The keystrokes are really good for being able to get through them. Yeah. Thank you. And obviously these were designed also for people who are just relying on the keyboard in general, not necessarily people who are just using screen readers. So obviously we're, we're trying to cover a lot of ground with using it. Uh, yeah. Regarding the right function, having to differentiate between the right function and the photos uh, versus comments, how do you do so we use the C key to comment and the L key to like. Was that your question? Uh, so I want to like the comment. So, okay. so we, we don't like the like comments with the shortcuts. Right now we just like the like the, the main parent post. That's that's an interesting feature request though. We should definitely consider that. Uh, the gentleman at the back? I just want to point out this is not a problem. The shortcut key is conflicting with um, screen reader navigation not a problem unique to Facebook. Right? Yeah. It's a general issue and, and uh, currently in the same way that uh, screen readers uh, analyze and uh, uh, do a bunch of interpretation of screen of, uh, of the document object model, they couldn't figure out what shortcut keys are being used on uh, any given page and let and give the user the choice of simply switching of, of um, using the page shortcut keys as the all instead of the screen reader shortcut keys. And it's not just talks, it's all screen readers. So if that's really an issue for screen reader manufacturers, I think that for Facebook, that you could lead the way by working with them. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, just to bring up that point even further, some of the screen reader manufacturers have what's called a bypass key which will allow you to bypass your next keystroke instead of sending it to the screen reader, sends it directly to the application. Yeah, right. yeah I think and again, that just takes the whole core functionality away from the screen reader interfering. That's true. There are further 
complications though with getting into that mode with JAWS. I can meet up with you after this talk and I can describe exactly uh, what we ran into and how we are trying to solve it. I think maybe you should potentially look at some of the other screen readers like NVDA and Window Eyes as other potential candidates. Don't focus in on one. Uh, right, these work well uh, with voiceover, which is which is what the demo is with. So, but thanks for that. Work. We we do try to include as many screen readers as possible in our testing process. Uh, moving on, one of the most interesting engineering problems that we encountered was making Facebook usable with high contrast mode. High contrast mode is a setting in Windows boxes which lets you pick a theme that changes the background and foreground color of links and text so you can read the screen better. Now, this sounds good, but the challenge with high contrast mode is that all background images are turned off in high contrast mode. Now, on Facebook, we render most of our images as a background image because this makes us load the site faster. This means if we have um, an edit icon, the little pencil icon, and um, it's rendered as a background image. Now, if you turn on high contrast mode, you're going to see a little black rectangle. That's the theme that I picked. Uh, it, the background color is black. So in this theme, the little pencil icon is going to show up as a black rectangle. And uh, the person uh, using high contrast mode would have no idea what this icon is referring to. So to solve this problem, we looked at our code image component and we forced it to render as an HTML inline image when we are in high contrast mode. This means the pencil icon is back to looking like a pencil icon in high contrast mode. Uh, there are additional challenges to making Facebook completely compatible with high contrast mode. We continue to figure out ways to make this experience better. Um, I'm now going to hand it over to Jeff. Cool. So I'm um, going to talk a little bit about our process around accessibility at Facebook when we started this about two years ago. So the first thing we did is we spent some time just figuring out what didn't work very well for accessibility uh, and for assistive technology. And we got at this a couple different ways. So on Facebook, we have a help center. A help center is basically a resource for our users, a covers frequently asked questions, and we have a dedicated page uh, for people with disabilities, people who are using assistive technology. And in this help center page, we have a contact form. This contact form basically allows people to send us bug reports or feature requests or any feedback that they have about our product. Uh, and this was a way that we were able to get great information from people who were using our Facebook product uh, in assistive technology. And this is one of the ways that we tried to figure out in the beginning, you know, what could we do better. In addition to this, we started auditing our own products internally in assistive technology. So this is a picture of Ramya. Most likely she is auditing an NVDA or JAWS. This is a Windows box. Um, so we spent some time going through all of our different products and all of our different platforms to understand where there are ways that we could do better. So we created this big list of things that we wanted to improve, both from the feedback that we got from users, but also just from our own investigations. And we put all of these things that we wanted to do better into a project management tool that we call Tasks at Facebook. Tasks is essentially the system that captures all the engineering work being done across the product. Is it accessible? It's a good question. It's not something we have focused a lot of time on in terms of its accessibility. We've been mostly focused on the user-facing product, but it does support a lot of keyboard shortcuts, which is nice. Um, so basically, Tasks allows us to have an atomic task for each of the things that we want to fix or improve for a product. It's kind of nice because you can see who owns the task, what the priority is of the task, if there's any code that's been written to you know, improve the task or make the product better. And we put all the work for accessibility right alongside all the other engineering work being done. And we use this as a way to start engaging product teams about accessibility, to introduce them to this topic of accessibility and help them figure out what they need to do to improve their products. So the next step was really scaling expertise and, and scaling knowledge around accessibility. You know, a number of other speakers have been talking about this, but one of the central challenges with working on complex web products 
or you know, web products built across many different platforms is that you have lots of different engineers who are building products and you want to enable them as much as possible to build with accessibility in mind and to, to design their code for accessible, accessibly as possible. So the ways that we tried to do that was one, is we started to create central documentation that captured best, best practices around accessibility. We did this for each of the different platforms that we support, things like Android, iOS. We wanted to create a living document that was a resource for all the engineers around the company working on product to have a better understanding of what they needed to do to make their products more accessible. Obviously this stuff is customized for Facebook stack, which is nice too, so we can talk through some of the you know, particular challenges of building within Facebook's environment. But this has been a great way for people to be more autonomous with accessibility at Facebook. In addition, on-site at Facebook, for anyone who goes off and works on Android or iOS, they go through internal training programs. And so we made sure that those internal, pro internal training programs covered accessibility best practices, um, information about the accessibility APIs for, say, Android or iOS, and introduced people to the topic of accessibility before they went off and worked on product teams. So this has, been, this has been another great way to raise awareness around accessibility um, across engineering. Another thing that we built is something called the Accessibility Nub. And it sits at the bottom of every single uh, internal www.facebook.com page. And essentially the Nub is basically like a fly-out menu. It allows you to toggle, to check a given design, a given interface for the absence or presence of some best practices, some, some basic tips uh, about accessibility uh, and sort of proper accessible code writing. So you can ask it to look at an interface and check for things like unlabeled form elements or images without all attributes. And in cases where a UI element might fail, we'll highlight that on screen or allow you to read sort of a printout um, of the places that you need to investigate a little bit more in terms of you know, writing more accessible.